Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm about to introduce our last speaker of the morning. But before I do, I just want to make one quick comment, which is to say that um, I would encourage you to please stick around um, when the talk is finished and not run immediately out the door, even though lunch will be awaiting you out there, because we do have a few announcements after our next speaker that we hope you'll stick around for um, that will tell you a little bit more about the rest of the day. So uh, when she's finished, please stay for just a few minutes and then your lunch will be ready for you. So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our final speaker of, well, I guess it's the afternoon now, but the, our final speaker of the first half of the day, um, Wendy Thomas Russell. Wendy is the author of Relax, It's Just God, How and Why to Talk to Your Kids About Religion When You're Not Religious, which, as you probably have already guessed again, is on sale in the Mark Twain House bookstore. A former newspaper reporter, Russell hosts the blog Natural Wanderers for the Patheos Faith Network, writes an online parenting column for PBS NewsHour, and is the co-founder of an independent publishing company called Brown Paper Press. I'm also happy to add that she serves as a member of the Yale Humanist Community's Advisory Board. And for those of you who are interested in hearing her thoughts on secular parenting, she will be speaking at our Sunday Humanist Haven gathering tomorrow at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in New Haven as a part of Yale and New Haven Humanism Week. Please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Wendy Thomas Russell. Hello. I guess this means I'm the last speaker, so I have to keep you guys awake, and I know you're hungry. <laughs> um, in 2011, Ron Lindsay, who is the president of the Center for Inquiry, wrote an essay on his blog. And he said, atheists and humanist groups should participate in interfaith coalitions only in exceptional circumstances. He said that he strongly supported the cooperation between people of religious uh, faiths and different beliefs. But agreeing to work under the banner of faith, he said, constitutes an unacceptable compromise. His argument was that atheist participation in interfaith grows out of a desperate need for acceptance, um, for us to be accepted at, a, at the table, a, you know, have a seat at the table, a table that we have been excluded from for way too long. And he said, uh, one more quote, um, sorry, he wrote, but I can't get too excited about being permitted to drink at the whites only fountain because we can pass. Now, this was five years ago and he may no longer feel that way. I have written blog posts that I deeply regret from five years ago. So people change their minds. Um, but it is a point of view that exists, and it is a point of view that is flat out wrong. Atheists must participate in interfaith movement. And we, we must participate because if we don't, we are cultivating an us versus them mentality, and it's, I think, and when I think of an us versus them mentality, I think of that as one of humanity's greatest failings. We, you know, the way in which we humans who have our DNA is so closely related to each other, and the way in which we can tear each other down so effectively and completely and, you know, hatefully is really extraordinary. Um, it's, it's something that no one is immune to. I, I, it's, a, it's almost cannibalistic, I think, sometimes. And, and yet, and we know, we know that love is the answer. Love is the answer. We've heard this from every non-religious, religious, wise person who has ever lived has said, love is the answer. And yet we fail to live it a time and time again. Love is the answer, and yet we fail to live it. And I, and I, and I, when I look at this universal truth, I, I think that it's part of the reason that I don't believe in God. It is, it, to me, it is, um, it, to, to, to accept death, I think, could be considered consistent with a higher power. Even suffering could be consistent with a, a higher power. But I don't think that hatred can be. And I don't, I, I, that may sound like a tangent, but I, I bring it up for a reason. I don't stand here as a quote-unquote weak atheist. I don't just simply disbelieve in a higher power. I actively believe that there is no God. And I don't see any reason to lie about that belief. It's just, it's the way that I believe. 
And I don't do it to be mean or provocative or confrontational. It's just the way that the, the facts have fallen in my brain. Maybe it's my, um, my background, my experience, my culture, my body chemistry, for whatever reason. Um, and, 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 and I say that because I, I think that in interfaith, some pe sometimes people think that we, we need to tiptoe around our truth in order to participate in interfaith. Interfaith does not require us to tiptoe around our truth. It's not about tiptoeing around your opinion in order to get along. It's about getting along in order to make the world a better place. Now, one thing I wanted to say first off, and that is that this issue of semantics, because it's something that Lindsay has a huge issue with. Um, and it is interfaith, we aren't a faith, it is archaic, it's misleading, it's frustrating because the Inuits have 50 words for snow. Like literally, it's not an urban legend, they have 50 words for snow, and we don't have one that encompasses faith and non-faith together. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the one thing that I, that I do think is, is interesting, though, is um, you know, while maybe there will be another word that will come along that will, that will be more appropriate, it's not as though the word was meant to ever exclude secularists. It came around at a time in the 1920s when probably secularism really wasn't on the radar very much. So, and I think that the, the common understanding of, it, of its definition is really expanding with the times. Even Wikipedia, which is like my Bible, um, warts and all, um, is, says that, uh, that interfaith dialogue is cooperative, constructive, and positive interaction between people of different religious traditions um, and or spiritual or humanistic beliefs. So let's, for the purpose of this discussion at least, not get bogged down by the literalness of the word interfaith, but rather, you know, it's happily, it's happily expanding definition. Now, one last thing on Lindsay, and then I'm going to leave the poor guy alone. Um, in, listen, in listing reasons for why secular should not take part in interfaith is, he said, it does not fulfill secularist goals, which he, he said are to promote critical reasoning and advance the view that faith is decidedly not a virtue. So I agree with the first part about critical thinking, um, but I take issue with the second part because I don't know about you, but part of my goal is not to advance the view that faith is not a virtue. Faith is not a virtue. Um, it's just like non-faith is not a virtue. Atheism is not a virtue, just like uh, religion is not a virtue. Whether you believe in a higher power is neither virtuous nor vile. It's what, what you do with those beliefs, where those beliefs take you, that reveals your character. Um, and when I, when I um, think about that, I guess, I, I sort of realize that it's, maybe it's the crux of the whole interfaith debate itself. Um, this idea that you know, non, some non-believers don't wish to take part in it because it, it, they see no merit to religion itself. It causes a bunch of you know, pain and suffering, and they worry that coming together in this spirit of mushy-gushy harmony is going to you know, require them to relinquish all of their honesty and integrity. And that's just something that we need to get over because it's, there's no question that religion causes you know, pain and suffering. It does. It does way too much. Um, but the thing that people need to get over is that you don't have to relinquish your integrity or honesty in order to participate. You, the only thing you have to relinquish is condescension and closed-mindedness and antagonism. And I think that if the only way to stay true to one's core principles or beliefs is to treat religion with close-mindedness and condescension and antagonism, then there's something wrong with your core principles and beliefs. Um, okay, I'm not going to say that there's no room for Richard Dawkins. I would not do that. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I think that would be Connecticut atheist sacrilege, and I come here in a spirit of unity. There is a, you know, there's a place for Richard Dawkins and Bill Maher and the new, the new atheist movement, and I, I think of, um, I think of, of new atheism as the bad cop 
to interface good cop. Um, the bad cop, which I admit is m the more entertaining of the two, um, he says, comes, it comes in and says, cut the bullshit and we're all gonna be better off in the long run. And Interfaith says, you and I are not so different. I'm your friend. Can, can I get you a cup of coffee? <laughs> Um, new atheism gets the satisfaction of the debate, and I think that it gets the, um, the glory of the win sometimes, but interfaith has a lot of benefits too, a lot more benefits, I think. Um, and it, it, it's more pleasant also, and it leaves us just feeling better about ourselves at the end of the day. Um, new atheism tears down stereotypes, it leads to friendship, it encourages education, promotes religious literacy, values diversity, it reduces hate, it builds confidence, creates avenues by which to fight poverty and corruption and ignorance and discrimination and so many other global maladies. Interfaith sets an example for our children and grandchildren. Interfaith is consistent with reality. Re religion is not going anywhere. It's um, it's here, and it also, um, it also removes the power of religion, I think. Uh, if I'm not fighting your religion, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just illustrating my confidence and my own lack of religion. It's, um, I allow you no power. You, you know, I, I'm, not, I've no, you're, I'm not threatened by you. you know, I have no reason to be defensive. But the best, the best benefit I know is that interfaith makes people feel good, and it makes me feel good. And I think that on a very personal level, interfaith benefits us. So how do we do interfaith? What does it look like on a practical level? So um, it's, when, I think of, <clears throat> when I think about interfaith, I think about a bridge. I think about a bridge from the faithful to the faithless. And you have, <clears throat> in order for it to work, you have to have one person step on that bridge from their side at the same time that another person is stepping on the bridge from their side. It's information sharing. It's allowing someone to share information about their beliefs at the same time that I'm gonna share with you something about my beliefs. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, it can be as simple as a Twitter exchange and it can be as profound as a TED talk. And I, when I was <laughs> rereading my notes, I thought, is a TED talk the most profound thing you can come up with? That is so that, I'm sorry, there's a lot more profound things, probably Middle Eastern peace talks or something. Um, <laughs> so I was invited to, and speaking of TED, actually, there's a really good um, group called the Interfaith Amigos, and you can, uh, you can Google them, and they do a little talk, um, and it's a rabbi and a priest and an imam um, who have this little shtick that they do and they go around the country and it's really sweet. Um, and, and one of the things that they say is, interfaith is not about conversion, it's about completion, bec becoming a more complete and fully human being. And from this space of interspaciousness, we can then collaborate on projects that are dear to all of our hearts, issues of social justice and earth care. In December, I was invited to take part in an interfaith panel and it was an evangelical church near my house. Um, I had met the preacher at my child's school. We hadn't known each other. We got to talking. We soon realized that we were completely opposite spectrums of the religious, um, ends of the religious spectrum, but that we had something in common, and that was that we both were interested in teaching religious tolerance. I to children through my book, or to parents really through my book, and he to his congregation through his church. So a few weeks later when he was putting together this multi-faith panel, which is what he called it, um, he asked me to join. So it was a rabbi and a imam and a Christian scholar and myself. And so we went and he, he and this is how he described, described it and I do, did appreciate this. So 
He said, um, this is his remarks before the panel started. He said, we've called this a multi-faith panel and not an interfaith panel. And we've done that because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes interfaith carries with it this connotation that we all have to water down our beliefs so that we can try to get along. And we all need to sort of find the lowest deno common denominator. I don't think it's necessarily helpful, and I think it's actually disrespectful. I would like to recognize that we live in a pluralistic global society in that, in that we need to find out how we interact in a public square where we can hold to our convictions and our beliefs and still talk to and about one another in respectful ways. And my hope is that we will model that today. That's what he said. Um, and as an evangelical minister, I thought that's pretty cool. Um, and he was right, he was right about the modeling. It made a huge impression on his congregation. The congregation had 850 people. Um, it was over three different services. Uh, so, and the four of us on the panel got along great. We were joking backstage. Um, the rabbi was a whiskey drinker. The Christian was a coffee drinker. I was both, so I was totally like, got to be in the middle. Um, <laughs> but we had a good time and we were joking on stage and off stage. Um, one of the greatest moments was when the, ra the oh, and, and the deal with the interfaith panel was that he, the minister came up with some questions to ask all of us and then we all answered them one by one. So it would be, you know, what are your core beliefs or what does your um, tradition think about the afterlife or um, what, what do people get, a, uh, get wrong about your you know, your, your worldview. So at one point, the rabbi was asked, um, what does your religion think about Jesus? And he leaned forward in the microphone and he said, we don't think about Jesus. <laughs> and then he leaned back. And it was this total mic drop moment. And everybody started laughing. And it was so cool, because here's a rabbi basically saying, I don't give a shit about Jesus, in front of a bunch of evangelicals. And they're like, this is their Messiah. And they're all laughing. And it was just so cool. It was this weird moment. It was surprising. And, and it, it showed me like the, the power of humor, I think, but, but also that interfaith can be surprisingly simple if we give it a chance. Um, afterwards, the parishioners came up to me, and they told me that um, they were really impressed by that, but it, it, and it made such a difference to them. And it wasn't it, the fact that we were all there stating what we feel and how, how we view the world completely um, honestly and openly, having some pretty heavy differences, as you can imagine, between all of us, and yet could still get along. They said it wasn't what we were saying it wasn't how we were saying it, it was that we were saying it side by side that made such a difference to them. Um, the, these are, the, what I've mentioned are quite public displays of interfaith, but they don't need to be, and I think that sometimes they're more powerful when it's on a micro level, when it's just person to person. Um, I think that you know, one on the one hand, you know, this kind of this personal brand of interfaith is is just being supportive of interfaith dialogue in general. It could be sharing a Facebook meme that you know um, supports celebrates diversity in some way. Uh, it could be avoiding comment sections of um, Hemet's blog. Is Hemet in here? I don't think so. I think I lost Hemet. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's uh, it's being able to um, to be active and to hear someone out and then gain, a, gain, gain some appreciation or maybe just take something of value from them despite the fact that they believe something quite differently and then allowing them to do the same. Um, you know, one, this is such a little example, but I went home for Christmas uh, last year. This is the first time that I've been back. This is my husband's family in Kansas, super conservative Kansas, and they, um, I hadn't seen them in a while, and my little niece, who was five, uh, when she greeted me, um, the first thing she said to me was, why don't you believe in God? Because <laughs> my book had just come out. <laughs> like, and, and I just cut down, and I said, well, I just don't. But can we be friends? Is that OK? And she said, yeah, and we hugged, and that was fine. And I thought, well, that's interfaith. You know, she, you know, I told her what I believed and she told me what she believed and, but we walked away from each other feeling relatively good about each other. You know, I think that's, that's quite successful. 
Um, there's lots of other examples, um, but I but I, I'm sure that you can come up with more than I could. Um, now, I would bet my rental car that some of you have not, it's not a nice rental car, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> don't get your hopes up. But, um, but that some of you have not agreed with some of what I've said today um, and or maybe something that someone else has said today. But the fact that you can listen to me and you can take something of value from what I say, that is all that we're talking about. That is interfaith. It's being able to disagree and still get something out of, of each other. Um, now, I, like I said, I, I'm not going to go through like all these examples of interfaith, but I do think there's three things that are necessary to, do, uh, to build these bridges between the faithful and the faithless. Number one, you must be willing to talk about your lack of faith. Um, it has to be the taboo of not talking about religion in mixed company just has to be pulled off the table. Um, we got to put ourselves out there. Number, uh, number two, you must be willing to exercise compassion. Um, we have to start scraping away the hardened judgments that we have um, and allow people to be flawed um, and still be good, to, be, to believe irrational things and still be good to be flat out wrong and still be good. Um, and, it, and it requires humility and it requires effort. Uh, it, it, for many of us, um, because of our experiences, religion pushes buttons for us. Um, it's, it's kind of, a, it triggers us. And I think that we just need to acknowledge that that is something that resides in us and make a de decent effort to you know, quiet or calm our reactions a little bit. Um, I'm not saying that you know you can't say anything. I mean, I, I think that we need to, um, to be willing to keep our innermost nasty thoughts to ourselves. <laughs> um, not saying everything on your mind is not dishonest. It's discretion, <laughs> and it's necessary. And Donald Trump does not know that, <laughs> but we do. Um, so now that I've made my case, I do have two caveats to my advice. Number one, I am not up here as a religious apologetic I, or apologetic of any sort. Um, you don't have to let religion get a free pass in order to engage in interfaith discussions. Um, in fact, I think it's the opposite. But you have to be willing to thoughtfully draw the line between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And saying... Uh, all religion is never acceptable, or faith is child abuse, or people who believe in God are irrational, that is neither thoughtful nor true. So number two is <laughs> interfaith is great, but it's not always appropriate. It takes two to tango. If you, you can build the bridge, you can step on the bridge, you can point out the bridge to the person on the other side. But if they're not willing to step on it, the discussion's over. And sometimes you're not going to be willing to get on the goddamn bridge. <laughs> it's true in all of us, I think, that um, you know we're not in the mood. We wake up in the morning and we see a million headlines of religious persecution and religious terrorism and religious sexism and hypocrisy and abuse, and maybe we aren't feeling our most patient and kind selves, um, and that is that's required of interfaith, and that is okay. It's okay to let off steam. It's okay to have righteous indignation. Um, it's okay to throw some motherfucking curse words around sometimes. <laughs> it's okay to be the bad cop. Um, so I'm not trying to guilt anyone or say you have to be zen about religion all the time. Um, or to make people feel bad for being judgmental sometimes or um, in writing or in person, um, or not being able to sort of ignore some basic injustices that are going on in the world. You are human. Uh, but if I'm affording you the luxury of you know, not being your most patient, most kind self all the time, most open-minded self, then I'm going to also extend that luxury to religious people because they are human too. So I'm trying to think if I have enough time to share this. Um, this is 
do I have enough time to share? Okay, this is just a little. I was writing, when I was writing the speech, um, I came across this story about Jennifer Garner. I was reading People magazine. Um, and she is starring in a new movie called Miracles from Heaven. And so that got my attention. And um, so the, the title and the whole story made me a bit itchy. Um, the movie is about a little girl with a life-threatening illness who then, shortly after her mother prays to God, falls out of a tree, hits her head, and is miraculously recovered completely from this fatal illness. Um, and when I, when I saw that, and it is based on a true story, so when I saw that, I thought, that is really cool. I love coincidences, and that is a neat coincidence. I really did. It was like, wow, how cool. Um, but that's, you know, not what most people were taking away from it. Um, so they were, taking, they were taking away that it was a miracle from heaven. So for her part, Garner went home. This is in the story. Garner goes home, and she tells her kids about this movie she's working on. And um, the kids are very interested, and they decide, well, you know, I want to go to church. So Garner starts taking them to church. And my bias is that I don't believe in miracles, and I think that teaching kids to have a relationship with a magic figure will end up providing them false notions of reality. That's my bias. Um, but then, uh, when my compassion kicked in, and I think sometimes it is like a switch, I thought, who cares? It's not as though the family didn't seek medical advice. This isn't a faith healing story. They went, they did everything they could for this little girl, you know, under the sun, and yet she eventually recovered. They're not sure why, and they gave credit to God. Who is that hurting? And then I thought, because I read People magazine, I happen to know that Jennifer Garner is in the middle of a divorce and um, that she has three kids. And I thought, this might be a really tough time for her kids right now, and maybe Maybe they, um, maybe she and maybe her kids need a little anchoring right now. Maybe they need some community support and a strong weekly message that even in dark times, things are okay. Things work out in the end. So that was my little, and it, and it really changed things for me. And my, I walked away with just much more like, you know, zen, I'm okay with this. This is all right. Um, so Ron Lindsay suggested that atheist participation in interfaith grows out of a desperate need for acceptance. I don't think there's anything desperate about interfaith. Um, I don't think there's anything desperate about wanting to be kind to kind people or wanting to be willing to accept people who are willing to accept you. Um, I think that... Uh, Oh, yes, and then I, after I finish my multi-faith panel um, at the church, so after I finish my multi-faith panel at the church, these two women came up to me, and this was surprising to me, but they said that they thought that I was the most brave person on the panel, um, and they thought I was very brave to be there that day, and I guess it's because you don't get many atheists on interfaith panels, so it was like a, it was a new thing, um, but... I just thought it was so strange to hear that because I don't see bravery in showing up and stating my opinions and my sharing my worldview with honesty and curiosity and compassion for other people. I don't think that's brave. And I look forward to the day when no one else does either. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Wendy. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question? We've got one in the back. So one of the criticisms that some atheists have of interfaith um, efforts and trying to work either in a religious setting or groups is that you're tacitly either endorsing them by participating or by not protesting some of what they're there for you're kind of by omission endorsing it. Mm -hmm. Where do you refuse to build the bridge? I mean, what do you do if there's a group where they want to work with you, there's a, an event or an effort where they might want to be involved, but their beliefs are so out there and antithetical to everything you stand for that you just don't see there's any reason to engage them because it would legitimize them? Okay, well, it depends on what you mean by everything you stand for. 
because if it's just that they believe things that aren't true or that you think aren't true, that's, to me, that's a non-issue. It has to be if they're a particularly um, nasty fundamentalist group um, that have extremist views that are really hurting people. I don't think they're going to be involved in interfaith. I don't think that those are the groups that really are posing a risk to our being able to come together and do some good. Does that answer your question, though? Well, for example, I've been involved in some charitable organizations that don't believe women should be involved in their organization. They want to do charity, they want to build things, you know, they want to volunteer, they want to drive blind people places, but women aren't allowed, period, because women aren't equal. Right. I would give them the finger. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes from Wendy you'll get a bridge, sometimes you'll get a <laughs> It's my next today. speech is going to be building the finger. <laughs> Do we have another question or two? Yeah, we've, down here we've got two questions. Um, hello. <laughs> I just want to say that my name is Rachel and I'm president of Long Island Atheists and I'm happy to be here. But that being said, um, I agree that interfaith is so significant even if you don't agree with everything that religion upholds. The fact that uh, we, like you use the word pluralist, that these people do exist, right? That's not going away. Right. We need to figure out how we can work together and to kind of answer that question of, well, if we figure out that we don't believe in something, what's next? Where do we go from here, right? Because we've kind of uh, attacked the idea of God existing or not to death, so where do we go from here and how do we continue? And I do want to say that on some level, um, to add to your speech, even if people don't want to participate in interfaith, I think we kind of do it by default uh, quite a bit. I've had a lot of people approach me at meetings and say, hey, you know, I'm going through a tough situation with my family. Maybe I've got someone in the hospital and, and I'm interacting with relatives that do believe and I don't. And what's the best way that I can be courteous and engage with extended family without seeming aggressive or bringing up my lack of belief? Um, so I think even if people don't see the benefit of engaging in interfaith, it's something that we happen to be doing constantly. Agreed. In everyday life, and I think that's something that people just need to recognize. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that the family is just a great example mm -hmm. of where interfaith could happen. Sometimes it doesn't. I think it's also the reverse is true that we're all doing anti-interfaith things, but we're not thinking about it. It doesn't seem like it's anti-interfaith, but it can be. It, I mean, it can be, because I think it's, it's a matter of sort of walking away from that interaction feeling good and, and allowing that person to still feel good about you. And I think that's with your example with interacting with um, family members, it happens all the time. So even if I, even if I'm not going to hide my beliefs, I'm going to say, well, you know, I don't believe that, but you know, that that's okay. And, and it's fine that you want to pray. That's absolutely, I'm not going to join you in that, but that's totally fine. I support you, whatever it is. But I mean, those are, th that's interfaith at work too, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add that, again, just to emphasize that you're going to need that skill of how to interact with people that believe in something different from you and how to engage with them because you can't hide forever as an atheist and never interact with people with different beliefs. That's just right. the kind of world we live in. So I, thank I you so much. Th thank you. I don't know if this is too optimistic, but I really feel like, and as I was writing my book, I really felt like it's not too far in the future when secularists are going to be the majority and the Christians are going to be, and everyone else obviously, but the Christians are going to be in a minority, and we need to start treating them the way that we would if they were the minority. Because right now we're sort of scrappy and, you know, the my, minority, we're going to take them down. And it's, it, that's not going to be the case. It just is not going to be the case anymore in the not too distant future. So let's start acting like the majority that we someday will be. And I just want to make one more comment, and I'll be super fast because I know we're all hungry. But um, yeah, Sorry. <laughs> also, you know, as an atheist, you don't want to be hypocritical and isolate people that have some kind of belief or want to engage with other people that are different from them or have friends. You know, you don't want to have that hypocrisy of feeling excommunicated from a community 
for wanting to maintain some things that you do like about religion. And again, I'm not an apologist either. Yeah. But you don't kind of want to turn that non-belief around and make people feel isolated all over again if they've just left one community to feel like they can't belong to another. Right. Thank you very much. And there'll be an opportunity to discuss this um, in even more uh, depth during the interfaith workshops this afternoon. And I hope you will go and continue the conversation there. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, is there someone who I haven't called on yet? Uh, yes, uh, you said love is the answer. Uh, what is the question? <laughs> The question and, is everything. Yeah. And <laughs> being an intelligent person, I just really want to know, do you really read people's magazines? Are you talking, are you talking about you being an intelligent person or me being an intelligent person? Because <laughs> you obviously are. <laughs> yeah, no, I really, I really look at it. I don't buy it, though, you see. I don't buy it. I only look at it if it's there, okay? Like the doctor's offices, so that's... <laughs> Wonderful. So humanity's failings is the question that I guess I was getting at, you know, all of the, just the, 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 the breadth of all of the terrible mess that we have gotten ourselves into, mostly the hatred, you know, and the um, discrimination and the... And People Magazine. And People. People is the problem. People is the problem. I, I just realized that. I'm going to go home and start my withdrawal. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Wendy for her talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, so as I promised, very brief announcements, and then we will break for lunch. So hopefully this morning's speakers gave you a lot of food for thought and lots to talk about at lunch and during our afternoon sessions. I have, as I said, just a couple of announcements before we go to lunch. First, I just want to put on my Yale Humanist Community hat for a second and mention our Humanism Week, which begins today. It's a week of free and open to the public lectures and events in New Haven. Um, and it, one of these events is the celebration event for our Greenlight Project crowdfunding campaign, which actually kicked off today to coincide with the conference. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of the Greenlight Project, it's an initiative to install an interactive sculpture uh, representing humanist values as well as a time capsule with words of wisdom for humanity onto the New Haven Green to go alongside the religious symbols that are displayed there each winter. So we're trying to offer a secular work of art that represents universal humanist values. Um, we are working with a really amazing artist and it's becoming a huge undertaking, but it's only possible if we have community support. And so if you're interested in learning more, I would invite you to please stop by our table and check out the materials we have there and there are some really friendly people there that you can talk to who will tell you more about this project. So a couple other things, um, book signings are happening. If you already own or ha don't yet own but would like to buy some wonderful reading material that I may, if I may, is maybe just a, one step up from People Magazine, um, <laughs> you can get those books at the Mark Twain House uh, bookstore and our authors are going to be doing book signings near where you registered. So please go uh, check out their books and buy them and support them for coming and speaking to us today. Um, please also be sure to visit the tables for all of our amazing sponsors. Without them, this event wouldn't be possible. They all have really uh, great materials and literature and swag on their tables. Please stop by, talk to them, take their stuff. They want you to. Um, this afternoon's sessions begin at 2 o'clock. So we're going to break for lunch, and then we'll resume at 2 o'clock. Just a reminder that they are community building. That's the first one that is here in the main auditorium. And these sessions run all at the same time. There are three of them. So you, get, you can have a chance to go to each one. So community building is going to be here uh, in the auditorium. Interfaith relations is going to be in the small theater just outside to the right. And political action is upstairs in the classroom. If you have questions about any of that, please look for anyone who's wearing one of these. Conference volunteer. They should be able to help you out. Um, and please, again, remember to complete surveys and to hand them at the registration table at the end of the day. Lunch, which is, I know, the thing everyone is most excited about in terms of these announcements, is going to be on your left as you leave the auditorium. Notice I'm not telling you this until the end of my spiel. Um, so please take your lunch and keep moving to find a spot in the Twain House to eat. 
There are benches in the hallway. Outside is an option, although it's a little dreary today. Um, but the upstairs cafe has tables. There are seats in the small theater or the main auditorium. Please find a spot, talk with people, make some friendships and connections, um, have a conversation or a debate about something you heard this morning. Just uh, take this chance to interact with each other. And finally, the last thing is after um, the workshops this afternoon, we're going to be reconvening back in here to close the conference. And there's a couple things you're not going to want to miss. So please, if you are sticking around for the full day, please do come back here at the very end so we can uh, sign off together. I do see a hand. Yes? Sure. Yeah, go for it. So, so each session, each of the three sessions, we'll go three times. So you can go to each session in any order you want. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I don't want to misspeak here, but I think certainly, you know, it's not a locked in stone kind of thing. If you, ha if you really want to switch the order, I think it's going to be okay. We do encourage people to try to stick to as much as possible what they signed up for, but there's some flexibility. And it's on the name tags. Thank you. Your and your lunch is on your name tag as well. All right. I think that's everything, right? All right. You are free to go eat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Sorry for this destruction. Oh, that's okay. It's not destruction. It's improvisation.